from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the African and Middle Eastern Division of the Library of Congress and to our noon time lecture series with special presentation today, the Rubion Mamelian Illuminated Armenian, The Life of St. John the Evangelist from 1757. I'm Joan Weeks, acting head of the Near East section. On behalf of all my colleagues, and in particular, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, uh, the chief of the division, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone. But before I introduce our speaker for today's program, I'd like to give a brief overview of our division and its resources in the hopes that you'll return and uh, use our collections in this magnificent reading room in your research. This division is comprised of three sections that build and serve the collections to researchers from around the world. We cover over 78 countries in more than 35 languages. The African section includes countries in all of Sub-Sahara Africa. The Hebraic section is responsible for Judaica and Hebraica worldwide. And the Near East section covers all of the Arab countries, including North Africa, Turkey, Turkic Central Asia, Iran, Afghanistan, the Muslims in Western China, Russia, the Balkans, and the peoples of the Caucasus, as well as Armenian collections. And now it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Livon Avdoyan, who will discuss one of the African and Middle East divisions top treasures. Actually, it's in the rare books reading room. <laughs> uh, well, it's one of the top treasures. And uh, the Rubian Mamalouyan Illuminated Armenian, Life of St. John the Baptist, Evangelist. Levin, <clears throat> Levan Adoyan received his BA in history from the University of uh, the South in um, Siwani, Tennessee, and an MA MA in philosophy, odd PhD in ancient history with a minor in Armenian history and civilization at Columbia University under Morton Smith and Nina Garrisonian. After a year as a fellow at Dumbo Oaks Center for Byzantine Studies in Washington, he joined the Library of Congress in 1976. He became a specialist for classics, ancient history, and Byzantine and medieval studies in the main reading room in 1982. And the Armenian and Georgia area specialist in the Near East section of the African Middle East reading room in 1992. Since that time, he's overseen the growth of the Armenian collections from some 7,000 items to over 45,000 currently. In uh, 2012, he curated an exhibit for the 500th anniversary for the first printed Armenian book, which drew close to a quarter of a million people. And the exhibit catalog became a bestseller at the library's gift shop. The library now has entered into an agreement with a publisher in Yerevan to produce an e-book version to know wisdom and instruction. The exhibit cataloged and authored by Levon Avdoyan. It will appear in the fall of this year. He's published and spoken widely both on Armenian history and on the digitization of Armenian resources and is truly a scholar of the highest caliber. Please help me welcome Dr. Levon Avdoyan. Thank you, Joan, and thank you all for coming on a day where we have so many events at the Library of Congress and the weather is not exactly conducive to bringing you out of your home. I know if I were retired, I'd probably be there reading at the moment, so I'm especially thankful. Before I continue, though, part of the purpose of these lectures is to show what a collegial atmosphere we have at the Library of Congress and the wonderful colleagues that we have. So I want to thank, first of all, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, 
who is the chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division, not so much for the daily in the ins and outs, but the fact that she shepherded the transition of this particular gem from the rare book reading room to our collections, where it joined its cousins, uh, Armenia, Armenian manuscripts, which start with a 1321 gospel. I want to thank Alice Burney from the Manuscript Division, who you will later hear uh, was responsible really for the mechanics of bringing the Ruben Mumbleian collection into the Library of Congress, most of it uh, in the Manuscript Division. Uh, I'd like to thank Yasmin Khan, whom I do not see uh, yet, Tamara Ohanyan and Claire Deckel from the Conservation Department. Much of what you will hear of the physical description of this gem comes from their expertise. And also, thanks to Claire Deco, when you are done listening to me ramble on about this uh, wonderful manuscript, you can see the manuscript in the first case behind you as you leave. I'd like to thank the Reverend Krikor Maksudian, who was my teacher at Columbia University and joined the Order of St. James of the Jerusalem Patriarchate in 1986 and is now an advisor to that marvelous manuscript collection in Jerusalem. And I would also like to thank the, comment, the people who gave comments after I delivered a different version of this lecture in uh, October of last year uh, at the Matanadran in Yerevan, Armenia. My purpose is to follow my wonderful colleague, Dr. Ann Brenner, uh, the Hebraic World Specialist, who started this particular lunchtime series with the idea that we should be speaking about the treasures in our own collection and making them accessible to, um, to you, the public and the researchers. So my purpose today is to have a conversation with you. I've not written it down. I've had some notes. Uh, with my age, I probably meets, uh, miss some of these. I'd like to have a conversation on this little gem which, as I was looking through it, I realized with its 156 pages, can foster research for at least four different disciplines. So it is truly one of those things that looks beautiful uh, and its beauty belies its true worth. Now, this is the Ruben Mamoulian Illuminated 1765. I'm sorry, that 1757 was my mistake, as you will soon see. Uh, due to my feeble intelligence. The 1765 AD Armenian manuscript of the history of the Acts of St. John the Evangelist, the Patmuchun Varuts Yeron Awin Hoanhu a Veteranchin, bequeathed by Azadia Mamulian to the Library of Congress. First, in an era where the most identifiable Armenian is Kim Kardashian, <laughs> I have got to explain who Ruben Mamulian is. I mean, I go around even to Armenian kids and say Ruben Mamoulian, and there's a hmm, blank face. Now, I grew up, I was born in a time where we knew William Soroyan, Arshil Gorky, Lucy Amara, Lily Chukasian, Mike Connors, and even Cher, and Ruben Mamoulian. Now here, for good reason, you see Mr. Mamoulian with Marlena Dietrich and Amelia Earhart. What is he doing there? Well, I can say that he's a film and, and screen dir uh, and stage director, and that will mean nothing. Uh, but then I can say he is the director of such little-known works as Porgy, Porgy and Bess, Queen Christina, Becky Sharp, Oklahoma, Carousel. He started Laura. He was fired from that. And he started um, the the Cleopatra with uh, Liz Taylor and uh, Richard Burton, and he was fired from that. But he was a very innovative um, director, very influential in the early part of the 20th century. And I draw my information here from my colleague Alice Burney's uh, press release upon receipt of his manuscripts. He was born in 1898 in what was then widely known as Tiflis, which is now Tbilisi, or was then, but is now, the Georgian Tbilisi, capital of the Republic of Georgia. He died in 1987. Uh, the library had long solicited his manuscript materials. It's a long, long uh, journey, which I, I hope someday the manuscript division will actually give us. Uh, he died. His wife, it was in his wife's hands. She died in, I believe, 2002? 
2002, and soon after, 2003, the materials were, were received, thanks again to Alice Burney's intercession, in the Library of Congress. I'd like to read what she states. The majority of the material in the Mamoulian collection is papers, but several other formats are also included. Books and photographs, music and audio sound recordings, film elements, and several things, on and on. One of the most wonderful afternoons I had is when Alice showed me some of the materials, and she opened a scrapbook of his production of Hamlet, and I noticed a letter from George Bernard Shaw to him, uh, written the day after his production of Hamlet opened in London, and it was typical Shaw. Congratulations on a marvelous production. Oh, and by the way, John Barrymore stank. So <laughs> I, could, I would be in seventh heaven if I uh, were actually into film uh, and stage. But that's not what we're here to discuss, although I am discussing it at this length because these papers are available to researchers in the manuscript reading room. The signed autographed copies of his books are in the rare book reading room. And this manuscript that we're about to discuss was transferred to the rare book reading room. And again, as I said, Mary Jane Deeb saw to its transfer to our collections. Now, Mr. Mamoulian was an excellent film and stage director, but he didn't know that much about Armenian manuscripts. However he got this manuscript, he loved it. You can see that it is in a beautifully tooled red, uh, red leather slipcase from which it has been removed because in conservation fa fashion it's not really good to, uh, to leave it in there. You will see that also in the case. He called it an Armenian Bible. We will soon see it is not a Bible. What is it? Well, let, let me give you the physical description of it. You see the, slip, the inside of the slipcase with the ex libris Ruben Mamoulian and the cover. And for this uh, description, I owe in the main the, the, uh, the information uh, to Yasmin Khan. It is 15.4 inches by 22.24 inches by 1.11 centimeters. It is um, a small book of 156 pages. The binding is fine goat skin over pasteboard with gilt and paint. The medallion and gold tooled uh, and gold painted with inlay. And the larger size, according to experts, of the medallion indicates that this is an Ottoman rather than a Persian origin manuscript. And this will be important for something we will discuss later. There is a, what is known as Islamic uh, chevron headpiece using pink and gold um, silk thread. And here you see, very barely, you see gold painted edges with a zigzag design which partially mimics, as you can see, here, the design in the medallion on the cover. This is basically a Western design paper. It is sized, probably with starch, and burnished with agate stone, which is yet again another indication of Ottoman manufacture. You will see why I am insisting on this when we, we discuss later um, the, the artistic elements. The end papers are again Ottoman design. It's quarto. The front pages are three leaves with one tipped in. Eight choirs of ten leaves. Back end papers are tipped in. There are extra, extra pages on the, the front and the back, probably to give it a heft and a, a beauty from the original. There are extra pages, and there are, as you notice, this is a hybrid mat, uh, manuscript. Western numerals as pagination. Unfortunately, you can also see here and in the previous and in the next page, bleeding of the type because this had been used with what is known as iron gall ink, which is already bleeding through and eating through the paper like rust. I believe that conservationists think that this could possibly disappear within 100 years if there is no cure for this, which, which really actually is endemic to manuscripts using a, this ink. The text block itself is 8.73 
centimeters by 14.13 centimeters. That's three and seven sixteenths inches by five and nine sixteenths inches with a gold border. And the text occasionally breaks the border, which is very, very interesting if you are uh, a student of manuscript production. Now, what we're going to do is go slowly through this manuscript. And I want to This is the colophon of the manuscript. Now, a colophon is, colophons, he should talk it on in Armenian, are the parts of manuscripts which tell you about who ordered the manuscript and who wrote the manuscript. Well, the commissioner of the manuscript is Paul, the son of the pilgrim Harachun Amira, who is resting with the Lord. And he himself is the son of Martyros Hovian. This is a very difficult passage to translate because, um, of the, of the range and, and the positioning of the words. But we know that it is not Paul, the son of Martyros, son of the pilgrim Harachun, because of what follows at the end. It is of my for, of aforementioned father, the pilgrim Harachun, who has died. Now, that sets who he is and what we need to know about Amiras. Amiras are a very distinct class of individuals in the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. And I draw the information here from the book called The Amira Class of Istanbul, who was written by a colleague of mine at Columbia University, Hago Barsumian, a very fine scholar, who unfortunately was kidnapped in 1986 and murdered and cutting short the life of a very fine scholar. The Amiras were very wealthy and had easy access to the Ottoman court and the administration. They used their wealth and influence within the Ottoman government, uh, governing class to further their leadership in the Armenian millet. The millet is the system the Ottomans used to govern the various religious minorities. Bringing the Armenian patriarchate under their control, they effectively controlled the whole Armenian millet within the boundaries of the empire and delayed the emergence of some institutions and helped in the development of others. They were instrumental in the cultural revival of the Armenian people. Their philanthropic generosity, on the other hand, though impressive, was not devoid of selfish considerations. In other words, they were used to the furtherance of their own riches. I like to think of them as the 1% of the Armenian millet in the um, Ottoman Empire. They could also afford what was to follow. Paul, the son of Harachun, writes on the top, I had this written with great delight from select paper, traced with beautiful letters fashioned from gold paint and richly ornamented in a variety of colors by a certain worthy notor notary and expert painter of flowers, the teacher of our youths. That's what he says. And he says further down, uh, the notary himself adds to his own colophon saying that I am the unworthy John, the notary from Beykoz, which is a uh, suburb of uh, Istanbul, son of the shoe uh, uh, repairman Matros Simonian, employee of the Amara, the Hovian Amiras. What is Beykoz? Beykoz, and it was very interesting how, how long it took me to identify this. Beykoz is the red district you see on the Anatolian side of Istanbul. And I was lying in my bed in Yerevan, in the Golden Tulip, Golden Tulip uh, Hotel in Yerevan, uh, looking over my lecture the night before the lecture, and I'm saying, Beykoz, Beykoz. And then I read that there was a church of St. Nicholas, Armenian church of St. Nicholas in Beykoz, also um, built in the 18th century. And all of a sudden, and thank God I travel with a flash drive full of images of objects from the um, Library of Congress, I remember that we had recently bought another gospel book from a unknown church of St. Nicholas somewhere in Istanbul. So it seems that within a space of 10 years, we, have, we now have two manuscripts from Be uh, Beykoz, and you see this unfinished gospel book on the bottom, and I'd like you to pay attention to it, because this is 
typical Armenian design. When was this done? In the reckoning of the Armenian era, 1214, 1214 plus 551 equals 1765, and in the Roman month of December, it's a hybrid manuscript. You use the Armenian era for one side and you use the month in the Roman era. Now we start the manuscript itself, and now we know that it is also not a Bible. It is the Vark, Surpuin Hohanua Veteranchin. It is the Acts of, uh, of St. John the Evangelist. No one, none of you can tell me that the Acts of St. John are part of the Bible, and we will, do, we will soon go into what exactly this is. I want to draw your attention to two things. I have never seen this kind of design uh, in an Armenian manuscript before, and uh, it's very interesting that at about the same time I was first investigating this manuscript, Dr. Brenner was talking about Hebrew manuscripts having borrowed uh, artistic devices from publications, and that is exactly what this is. I have not identified it, but obviously this is taken from a plate, some kind of published book plate, and made into a manuscript tradition. Now, I said that what you can learn from little manuscripts and the, the varieties of um, research that you have, another research that has yet to be accomplished is why, after the era of printer starts in Armenia in, in uh, 1512, are there still so many manuscripts being produced? And they are, but they're also borrowing from, um, from the publications. But what I also want to do now is to tell you what this is. This, the Acts of John are what we call apocryphal um, acts. And I'm going to quote from Henneke Schneemelcher, and I, this brings back wonderful days studying uh, biblical theory and canon under Morton Smith, going back to these sources. Uh, the New Testament apocrypha are writings which had not been received into the canon, na namely the 27 or 28 books which are received in the Western and Eastern churches into the New Testament, uh, which had not been received in the canon, but which by title and other statements lay claim to be in the same class with the writings of the canon. In other words, they were authored as though they were canonical gospels and which from the point of view of form criticism further develop and mold the kinds of style created and received in the New Testament, whilst foreign elements certainly intrude. In the second and third century, we have a series of apocryphal acts of the, um, the saints and of the evangelists. This is one of the most popular. It exists in a Greek original, it exists in a 5th century Armenian translation, which seems to be very close to the Greek original. From the Armenian translation uh, comes the uh, Georgian translation. There is a Syriac translation, which is used to uh, produce an Arabic translation. They were very popular either as a whole, or in this case, uh, in part, the last chapter of many of the manuscripts gives you the dormition, the rest, the death of, of, the, of St. John, as this does too. This is not the place to really go into biblical criticism uh, and to go into the role of Apocrypha. Let's, let's just say Apocrypha, however, can now be more than one thing. You can use Apocrypha for heretical Gnostic literature, you can use Apocrypha for literature like this, which was received in the church, but not considered canonical. And that's what this is. And as a matter of fact, uh, um, Professor Robert Thompson, who was the former professor of Armenian at Harvard and Oxford, and the former director of Dumbarton Oaks uh, Center for Byzantine Studies, is actually producing a study on a 12th century Armenian commentary on that last portion, the Dormition, which means it was honored by the church. It was not considered canonical, however. And now we go into the manuscript itself, because I, I actually want to leave room for um, questions and discussions on this. First and foremost, this is the Incipit page. You can see I asked you to look at that other gospel from Bekos, which was typically Armenian. You can see you still have the headpiece and the side gloss but it's totally different in artistic flavor, in artistic temperament. The portrait of St. John is almost European in style. This is not a typical Armenian portrait. 
Uh, the fl it is loaded with flowers. Remember the colophon? I, I have ordered him to produce varied colored and brilliant flower productions. And it is a hybrid. It was very interesting to see when this manuscript first appeared, and I showed it to a variety of scholars without reading the colophon, which identified Bacos. Well, this is obviously Iranian, because there was a large Iranian component. No, this is obviously Turkish because of this. Well, it proves to be Turkish, but so entrenched is, are the thoughts of certain people. When I finished the version I gave in Yerevan, uh, one of the great scholars of Qajar art, uh, Dr. Raya Amerbekian, insisted, still insisted, uh, that uh, this is a product of the Iranian-Armenian community and not the product of um, Ottoman artistic effort uh, in Bekos. So we will, I'm not about to go into that and to determine it, but I happen to believe in the, in the colophon. The problem is John, Johannes Simonian, the notary, the artist. Obviously, he was a brilliant artist. He produced a brilliant work. This is not the work of a new a neophyte. And yet, this is the only manuscript I have identified that we have of his. So there's no way to really trace anything else. So we have, again, the history of the Acts of, the, um, of uh, St. John the Evangelist, followed by chapter one. There are 11 chapters, which indicates actually its proximity to the original Greek version, and therefore the antiquity of the Armenian version, which was done in the fifth century after the creation of the Armenian alphabet in approximately 407 AD. The first chapter indicates, as do all 11 chapters, the fabulous nature of apocryphal literature and especially the acts of the apostles. This is not biblical, uh, this is not necessarily religious. It is patterned after a Greek novelistic style with fables and humor and religiosity and magic. This one is about uh, what, when and what kind of torments he bore and what kind of miracles the holy um, John wrought. And you can see him on his first page. I wanted to include two pieces of, you've seen the, the flowers. These are two pieces actually of Iranian uh, manufacture we have in the African and Middle Eastern division, the Near East section, uh, part of our Islamic um, book bindings, and also a pencil case from roughly the same period. And this is the sort of material that leads Dr. Amir Bekian and others to say that the influence came from the community in Julfa rather than Ottoman. But I think, again, we have, that's a long shot. The second chapter shows you even more the flowers that Bohos, Paul, ordered to be drawn by uh, Johannes. Each flower is different. Uh, and I want to say that I ran these flowers by some botanist friends of mine, and I said, can you identify these flowers? And they said, no. And I think my friend here I sent them to once, but I do know that one of my botanist friends said there are too many or too few petals. These are not real flowers, uh, and which made me feel better because I, I said, I don't know what these are. They are incredibly delicate and incredibly beautiful. Uh, Bolchos got his money's worth, to be quite um, frank about it. Uh, what you also would like, should notice is, are the capital letters, even though you don't know what they are. These, however, are typically Armenian. These are traditionally Armenian in design. So you have a Europeanized Istanbul kind of um, drawing here, a typical Armenian here, the gold that Pohos wanted and in the chapter, which is about the exile of the, um, of the uh, Apostle of Christ, St. John. The third chapter, again, with a different kind of flower and a different kind of unctual with the, the bird motif, is about Mirion and his entire house and his coming to St. John. And another flower in, in the fourth book concerning Basil and his wife 
and how they were illuminated, baptized by St. John. So here we clearly have a religious element in this chapter. The, the, the uh, fifth chapter is about the persecution of the demons. So this is not so biblical. This is obviously, again, a fabulistic uh, element to uh, St. John with a, yet another flower. And also, if you have been noticing, each one of these headbands, which starts the first um, sentence of the, um, of the chapter, has different type color, different uh, background, what we would call fill, and according to Yasmin, a very rare pigment, pigment when we use the white. The sixth chapter is about Kiplionis and his sorcery. Again, we are getting into what we, are ta we can term a very Greek novelistic style. Seventh, again, about the, um, about the demon who took on the aspect of a wolf. This is not the sort of thing you see in the canonical gospels or even in the, um, in the, Corinth, uh, in the Pauline epistles, a different flower. The uh, eighth is about, uh, again, another individual in his entire house and what they did to John. I, 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 I look at these flowers and I say to myself, I, that looks so familiar. But uh, again, I, I cannot identify it. The, the ninth is about Sosispatris and his mother, the evils that they wrought, presumably against St. John. And I'm going through these slowly so you can get a flavor for what kind of work this apocryphal act is. Oh, and I would like to point you, here you have a quite identifiable bird motif, which is typically can you see that? Typically um, Armenian. And the 11th, concerning the gospel of John, how he related it, and in what place it was re the, the faithful received these gifts. Obviously, we are getting into the meat of St. John, the evangelist. St. John is usually shown in gospel portraits dictating his gospel to his faithful scribe, Pacomius. Usually, at least in the older Armenian tradition, you see the hand of God coming uh, from the frame. In the, this this uh, reflects a relatively recent aspect of, of uh, art history where the hand of God is not there, but he is now dictating his um, gospel to Pacomius in the fields. You know, usually it's inside in an inside setting. It is a charming setting. And what is the heading? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God was the word. The, the opening of the um, gospel of St. John. And I find this possibly the most moving of all the pages in this exquisite little um, manuscript. It is um, about where and why uh, the wonderful and blessed John had his vision and how he adopted with great care the public. This is immediately before the, saint, the death of St. John. And this is the one time that you will see, rather than facing forward, I don't know if you've noticed it, the flower is facing away from the reader. I have asked many art historians whether they have ever seen this used before in proximity of death. And so far, no one has given me a satisfactory conclusion. But I would argue that that before the vision of St. John, exquisitely detailed, and before the final chapter, the rest, the repose of St. John, the evangelist, you can see him going into his grave um, and to his repose. 
uh, I would argue that that flower is a symbol of, of death, at least in the eye of this particular no um, notary, this particular scribe and artist. Notice again the exquisite detailing of this manuscript and also it's something that I have not successfully studied. Why the dove in this manuscript, both in the beginning pages and the end pages, is black. You usually see a white dove. And this is, again, something that I would like to delve into or like to have art historians delve into. I think I've demonstrated with the colophon, with the nature of the, the book itself, with the art, and with biblical literature, that this little gem can support several different aspects of scholarly research. But what about the future? And we're all about the future here. Azadia Mamoulian's bequest to the Library of Congress did something that I wholeheartedly approve of. It took a collection and a manuscript like this out of the vaults of a private collection and it put it into this great institution where everyone is free to use it. In short, this manuscript is now available to the public and it will be even more available to the public uh, because within, I'd say, about six months, a digital version will be online in the World Digital Library and on our own online site. So what do I expect scholars to do? Well, I expect those who uh, are interested in the Amiras to use the information in the colophon about the Hovian family uh, of Bekos to add to what Hagop Barsoumian wrote in his wonderful book on the Amara class of Istanbul. I expect an art historian or someone to try to search out other manuscripts written and decorated and illuminated by Johannes Simonian, the notary, I expect a new critical edition to be fashioned from this because I did have the time to look at this, this edition and compare it you know, section by section to the one critical edition that exists based on two manuscripts published in 1878 in the Ankanon Girgir Hayots no Katakaran, which is literally the non-canonical Armenian books of the New Testament. Uh, and believe me, preparing a critical edition of a manuscript is not the easiest work. And I would expect further argumentation about exactly where did this artistic tradition come from. We know that they lived in Bekos on the Anatolian side of Istanbul. We know that the Amara class actually had, they claimed their origins from the uh, Ottoman Turkish city of Aachen, Kemalia in Anatolia. Uh, we know nothing about Hohenes Simonian other than his fact, the fact that his father was um, in the service of the Hovians, Hovian. We don't know, however, what influence might have come from Iran, the merchants of Iran. We don't know what influence might have come from Europe because there's obviously European influence in this manuscript. So, what I'm hoping I have done in these brief minutes is to take a small 156 page manuscript and show you the different things that can be done with it. And to say those of you who are trained in any of these disciplines are more than welcome to come back to see this and any of the other Armenian manuscripts we have. And with that, I thank you. I would welcome some questions if you have them, but I have to tell you first that as, the, as you can see, um, this lecture is being uh, filmed for future uh, webcasting. So by asking a question, you are giving us permission to include you in that webcast. And with that, I believe you had a question. It's typical of most manuscripts that I know. Now, this is counterintuitive. 
uh, uh, contradictory, actually. Um, someone who has wasted, wasted or actually used pages of blank pages, both at the beginning and at the end, starts the chapters immediately. But I can see why he does that. It is, it is actually more artistically fulfilling to see, to see a, a continuity of the pages. But yes, I mean, most of the, most of the uh, manuscripts I've read for my own work have continued. I think you need to look at the, actually, the incipit page, which you see there. There's a lot of color there. The variation, maybe you could not see it, the variations on the unctuals, the variations on the headbands, the variations of the flowers. Um, no, he has, as the colophon demanded a variety, a great variety of colors, and he, his palette was quite broad. Thank you. This is Alice Burney, by the way, who shepherded the, um, the collection into the library. And you've done so much with it. Um, I wondered if you had any time to look into the provenance of the book. Uh, and if you could tell us a little bit about how he got this, what he thought of it. Well, I didn't. Uh, and what he thought of it was it's obviously a beautiful book in the Bible, which it isn't. Do you have anything to add? This is uh, Mr. Jensen, who is a, has actually been studying uh, Ruben Mamoulian. That's a good guess. Um, I, I don't know if you heard this, but um, it is his supposition, since it is a rich, uh, Ruben Mamoulian's mother was wealthy, it could have been in her possession. I doubt very much that this was a gift. Um, no one would give this superb manuscript up as a personal gift, especially an archbishop. Um, so I, I think my, my colleagues, my Oscar Geats, uh, would, uh, would agree with me. Uh, there, there is a mystical possession of manuscripts here, and if it's in the wrong hands, um, it is not accepted. So this was either bought or inherited. That would be my guess. Now this, of course, as a historian, makes me, uh, makes me unsettled that we're even considering these things without any proof, but we're just putting this out, the possibilities. Anyway, there was an, yes? <coughs>
I learned a long time ago in, in my period, not to say definitively, definitively, unless someone says, I took this from X, that this is exactly the case. On its face, however, by the primary evidence, which is the colophon, this is a work of Ottoman design. But trait, uh, influence, artistic influences went east, west, north, and south. So as again, I would like to find out more about Johannes Simonian. And if we don't find more, then we're going to have to really rely on one, the colophon, two people like Yasmin and others who view the, the size of the medallion and the construction of the, of the, uh, the chevrons and their knowledge of what the physical artifact was like in both cultures. Yes, Tom. A critical edition of the Armenian uh, version, and unfortunately, it was based only on two manuscripts, one of which was not complete. One did not have the Dormition, the other one did. So I don't. Greek is the original. It's a second and th definitely second or third century um, authorship. The first time it was mentioned by anyone is by Eusebius of Caesarea. But we're sure that all of the apocryphal acts of the, of the evangelists were written in the second and third century. No, it doesn't. No. <laughs> I was trained by Morton Smith. And that means you don't have an opinion unless you've read everything. And I mean everything. <laughs> so I don't. I, I have got to admit, I'm a historian. I'm not a hagiographer, thank God. I'm not an art historian. What I, I remember many years ago when I first started graduate work at Columbia University, Professor Moshe Held in the Department of Middle East Languages and Studies, all of the professors were brought out so that they could indoctrinate the new students. Well, he sat back rather arrogantly and said, okay, my job is to tell you what the text says. That's all I'm interested in. I don't wanna, be, I don't wanna uh, analyze it. I don't wanna do anything. I'm going to tell you what it, what it says, and then you can do what you want. That's exactly what I've done here. I've tried to explicate the, the manuscript and make it available to researchers in a variety of disciplines. Um, if this had been a historical ma a manuscript, a manuscript about Armenian history or something, I wouldn't let you see it. I'd be running with it myself. <laughs> there is an English translation of the, uh, the Greek Acts. And there is a, a French translation by Le Lois of the first chapter of the Armenian Acts. But no translation of the Armenian Acts in total. Uh, we do know, as I, I've told you, that the newer versions of the Acts of St. John have many more chapters than 11. The older version has 11. The fact that the Armenian uh, version has 11 chapters indicates it's very close to the original. And indeed, it, that's not to be, that's not surprising. Uh, the Chronicle of Eusebius of Caesarea is incomplete. In some cases, the Armenian translation not only provides the, the sections that are not in the, uh, the, the, the Greek version we have, they also antedate the Greek version that we have so that they're e even older than the Greek version. So, I mean, we have to remember that all the ancient languages of the Middle East were used to preserve, to translate into and preserve the riches of previous cultures. Anything else?
Oh. Here's a Dr. Brenner. She's she's very kind. But anyway, any any very good. Thank you so much. I truly hope you will come back. And may I say that on May 8th, we are having the Vartanant's lecture uh, delivered by Dr. Uh, Susan Harper. It will be in the room behind us. And it will be on American humanitarian assistance in the Armenian crucible 1915 to 1923. And I hope we will see you there. If we can't see you then, on May 8th, we will be having a display, a major display of Armenian manuscripts, books, maps, et cetera, again in the Northeast Pavilion uh, and for the public. And I hope you see, see you then. Thank you for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.